you don't think Bitcoin's a good asset to buy or sell, to own, we can have an, an intelligent discussion about that. Not everyone believes in every asset. Um, if you think that it's a Ponzi scheme or you think that it's, um, you know, has a higher probability of fraud, you're, you're, either, you're either misinformed or you're using, you're using weaponized misinformation, which some people absolutely are. They're, they're smarter than that. They're aware of what's going on. They choose to weaponize misinformation. Uh, Bitcoin, you know, crypto as a tool for money laundering for terrorism, the classic example of weaponized misinformation. We know demonstrably it's not true. So if you're faced with that, you know, that, that type of misinformation, um, I think you either have to, you know, again, if it's the first type of misinformation where someone's just genuinely unaware, uh, you educate them. Um, if you're faced with weaponized misinformation, you have to just fight back through either uh, litigation or, or uh, through the political, political means or through uh, public appeals. And I think the industry is doing that very well. And so I think the industry is winning overall. Joining us now on Speak Up is John Diagostino, who's head of strategy for Coinbase International and a dear friend of mine for two decades. And John, since I'm lying about my age and I expect you to be lying about your age when you get to my age, just say that we just met each other here on Speak Up. But welcome to the show. And uh, before I get into it with you, though, tell us a little bit about your background. because You have a fascinating background. Uh, and I'm going to ask you, as a result of this, I'm going to ask you a lot of macro questions, if you don't mind. Yeah, sure. Uh, so, Andy, as always, thanks for inviting me. Uh, it's always a pleasure to speak to you on or off the air. Um, you know, you and I grew up, I think, in very similar circumstances. Um, I was, you know, in retrospect, you know, it's funny, I think about these things now a lot as I get older. I never thought of myself as being um, disadvantaged, if you will. Uh, and then I took a trip to my childhood home, which I hadn't seen in about 30 years, and it kind of struck me. Uh, the conditions we lived under, um, but I had you know an amazing, amazing set of parents who worked incredibly hard. My dad had three jobs, my mom had two jobs. Um, grew up in Staten Island, uh, first generation Italian, Italian American, um, first one in my family to go to college. And uh, you know, again, I think back to what my parents had to do to put me through high school, college, and then graduate school. Um, first one, I think even in my extended family to go to graduate school and to have that all happen on the salaries, their combined salaries growing up with, you know, two children, um, was just extraordinary. So it, 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 like you, I've heard you speak about this. It, it taught me a work ethic. Um, unlike a lot of my family, I had a desire to leave, not to get away so much as to explore. So at a fairly young age, um, I uh, spent time studying uh, abroad at Oxford. I lived in Dubai. I lived in Moscow. Um, and I was always sort of the first at any job I took to put my hand up and say, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll try that out. You need someone to go and negotiate a, a transaction. Um, you know, and they sent the young guy because they didn't really expect it to work or they weren't really that interested in it. Um, I used those opportunities to do things I just didn't have the luxury of doing when I was a child. Listen. I love you. I relate to you. You're you. You've got a hustle and a tenacity to you. You've also got a huge brain, and so I want to start with the apple falling on your head related to Bitcoin. I've already talked about my apple falling on my head. You got yep. there before I did. So tell us what happened. Yep. Tell us why it happened. So so two ways. What so my life has been about marrying. I think to some degree yours as well. Marrying the academic and the practical. I, I graduated from Harvard Business School, and instead of going into the Goldman Sachs training program, which is a wonderful training program, I went to go work on the floor of the New York Mercantile Exchange because I felt I would learn more from that. Um, I had a ton of academia throughout my, my life, and then I wanted the most real practical scenario. So I, I, I say that to, I was very, very lucky. I was teaching at MIT, um, lecturing, not a full-time professor, but um, so I was around people um, at the university that were looking at Bitcoin, looking at um, how to use blockchain as a store of, uh, to produce a store of value fairly early. So I'd heard kind of rumblings about it in the bowels of MIT at the Media Lab and Connection Sciences Lab. And I was reading what they were writing and I was talking to people way smarter than me. Um, and then around that time, um, I was extremely lucky to, um, to write. Uh, so the Dow hack occurred. I don't know if you remember the Dow hack. And, um, I wanted to learn more about it. The best way I know to learn about something is to is to work 
under or with someone who knows more than me. So I wrote a paper with a, a professor at MIT around problems that I saw from a governance perspective and how it was organized. That forced me to understand the, the underlying technology. So that was the academic part. On the flip side, as you know, I spent, I spent a significant amount of time in the, in the Middle East. And I had a dear friend who comes from uh, a fairly well-to-do family, and I won't say which country, but um, in a country where it's not unlikely that a well-to-do family could get a call saying, hey, you know, give us your money or you're not going to like what happens. And I'll never forget him telling me, and this was when, the, you know, back when there was a really, uh, even more so than now, an intense conversation about whether the volatility of a store of value, uh, the volatility that Bitcoin exhibited would ever make it useful as a store of value. And I remember him telling me, more or less, John, if I get that call, if I'm lucky enough to get that call, by the way, which means I've got an hour or two to get the hell out of the country. Um, uh, you know, I'm not sure. Are we allowed to? Are we allowed to use blue language on this on this uh, podcast? What's the what's the rule? Listen, I'm running. I mean, come on. I, I don't know why they let me <laughs> you. Yeah, yeah, he, looks me and says, he looks at me and says, John, I can put ten million dollars onto something the size of my thumb, shove it up my ass, and run. Then he leans over the table. I'll never forget. He goes, John. You can't shove $10 million of gold up your ass. So it's funny, it's silly, but, but these, these very, very simple attributes of Bitcoin, immutability, storability, uh, fungibility, uh, partial uh, um, a distance from government intervention, make it so unique and something we haven't ever seen. So it's an absolutely new series of characteristics that don't exist anywhere else. Um, that was the aha moment for me. Okay. I mean that. I mean, you know, I, I, I actually. You told me that story. I used that story in Saudi Arabia. You know what somebody said to me as I'm trying to fix my hair? He said yeah. to me, "How about two hundred million dollars?" He said, "You tell Diagostino exactly. I could put two hundred million dollars." <laughs> it's the same, you know, USB. You could put two hundred million dollars, and that's and, the magic. Yeah, and that's the magic. But, but. I want to go to the age of post-truth and the age of disinformation. Yep. There is so much disinformation out there related to crypto, Bitcoin, the markets. We have this great resistance coming from the SEC still. Um, you know, to the extent you can comment, I would like you to comment on that. But let's just talk about the age of disinformation. Tons of bad misinformation out there. Let's yep. start with what's accurate and what isn't. So maybe we just start one step further, if you don't mind, because, you know, mm -hmm. I, I've got young kids and, and I spent I spend a disproportionate amount of my time uh, doing two things with them, trying really hard not to instill my biases in them beyond, beyond the biases that I know for sure are, are correct, i.e. Mm -hmm. treat people well. And the other half, and this is horrible, I have to spend time teaching them at seven and 11 um, how to distill truth from misinformation. Um, mm -hmm. And man, it's hard. I, I, I'm certainly no expert on it. So I, I spend as much time filtering sources of information as I do actually analyzing that information. Um, and I think we've got a really great tool now in AI. What I mean by that is, you know, before, let's face it, I, I don't know about you, I don't have time. When, if the ECB puts out a report on, on inflation, I don't have time to go through those 200 pages, at least not in any meaningful way. I'd love it if I did. I just don't have that leisure. Um, I admire people who have the tenacity to spend it. I know folks who take like an hour a day and they just block it off just for hardcore reading. I can't mm -hmm. do that. Um, now we have tools that can summarize that report fairly quickly, the way an analyst would. They have to be careful. They hallucinate. But I'd argue that the risk of a hallucination on a simple prompt of summarize the main points of this article is about as great as the risk of hallucination from uh, an unbiased uh, analyst. So you've got resources. You've got SkyBridge. I'm lucky enough. I've got, for crypto, I have an incredible research, resource in Coinbase Research. They produce phenomenal, um, un, I view them as very, very unbiased because exchanges, you know, we don't care about price direction. We care about integrity of market structure. Um, so I have that resource. I have the boards of directors of hedge funds I sit on um, that have to be unbiased because they need, they need it for, to make analytical investment decisions. But most people don't have that, Anthony. So I'm going to flip the question back to you. What advice do you give people? You're a bigger personality than I am in, in every sense of the word. What do you say to people who say, I'm just so confused. Forget about Bitcoin for a second. Forget crypto. Just in general, 
How do I get a handle on what's real and what's not in terms of making a personal financial decision? Well, you know, what I, what I would say to them is that in my life experience, uh, the cognoscente, the uh, mainstream hated Amazon. Mainstream hated a company like eBay. The mainstream yeah. poo-pooed Google. The mainstream said that we would never get the regulatory authority for Uber. Um, and so NVIDIA was a gaming company that was really a bit of a joke. And so we have to be very, very careful about the mainstream, you know. And so I'm not saying that we don't have. I want to measure my words here. I'm not saying that we don't have charlatans in this industry. I'm not saying that we don't have levels of fraud in this industry. Mm -hmm. and for those reasons, we need propitious and good regulation. But I do believe, and I believe you believe this, and I think your organization believes this, that Bitcoin is a technology that is representative of value. It is a store of value. It is. It meets all the measures that you and I would look to for mm -hmm. money, the history yep. of money. Uh, it has all of those characteristics. In fact, if anything, it's technically refined better than anything that we've used for money in the past. So therefore, in an age of digitization, it should be treated as an asset class and it should trade to at least the value of gold. And so yep. I would ask people to try to cut through the disinformation that's out there. And I would ask people to please, uh, uh, you know, take a leap of faith you know, uh, George Soros, they've polarized that name now politically, but George Soros, one of the legendary investors on Wall Street, would say, invest first, investigate later. And I would tell people, get off zero on something like Bitcoin. And yep. if it's even a sliver of Bitcoin and you start learning about it, I think you'll be better off. I don't know. What do uh, you think? Yeah, I think everything you said is right. I'll go a step further. I think, um, you know, I got my star on the floor of the NYMEX. This was not 1960. This was 2002, 2004. And, and 868 roughly guys were using hand signals and paper cards to price crude oil. And we knew back then that that was ridiculous. It worked. By the way, it worked. It was wonderful. But we had the technology even at that at, at 20, 25 years ago. We knew. So, so back then, as a freshly minted MBA, I didn't know when, but I, would, I knew with 100% certainty that the NYMEX would go electronic at some point because it was clearly a better decision. Now, it had to be weighed in over time. There, there are issues. You, know, you can't just flip the switch and, and just you know, the burn it down, folks. I'm not a huge fan of. You have to be thoughtful about how these very important systems get transitioned. I don't want to be in a plane when the pilot comes and says, hey, good news. We have a much better engine design that's never been tested, and we're going to try it out today. I, I want that to go under rigorous testing. So, so, so pacing is important. I'll argue that standing here today, I look at my 11-year-old daughter, my 7-year-old daughter, the notion that when they're my age, they will A, not have a ubiquitous digital store value. Now, I'm not suggesting it's going to be the demise of the U.S. dollar, all, their, all other asset classes go away. But the notion that they're not going to have that is insane. It's as insane as anything you hear in crypto. The notion that they're not going to be using tokenization to better represent assets in trading, but the notion that smart, programmable digital securities will not exist for both securities and non-security assets, that's crazy. Now, do I know exactly when that tipping point is going to occur? I do not. But of course, it's going to be there when they're my age. And so if you start with that, then it just becomes a matter of, to your point, how much do you want to bet on timing? Because it's not really a question of when. It's a question of, I'm sorry, a question of if. It's a question of when. Oh, no, I agree. I'm not saying very carefully because it's a, it's a vexing time for all of us. Uh, to the extent you can comment on U.S. regulation. If you can't, that's fine because I understand the situation with the company. But the extent you can comment generically on U.S. regulation, please do. If not, I'll go to another question. I can comment generically because you know, Coinbase puts out public statements on it. I mean, um, you know, and I'll, I'll say my personal opinion, which I think aligns well with, with the overall corporate uh, view. Um, it, you know, I, I believe that the, the average person who works that a U.S. regulator wants what's best for this country. I genuinely do. I know that's not, that's not very popular in crypto. There's this attempt to demonize the entire uh, staff. I think that's wrong, and I don't think anyone from Coinbase has done that, and I, I, I admire them for that. Um, I think that um, it's scary for them. 
faced with the new technology and faced with the burden they have to protect to protect markets. Um, I think that they've gone astray in terms of the direction. Uh, I don't ascribe any malicious intent to that personally. Um, I think that it's ha it, it's it's that 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 bad way of governing is losing. I think it's clear that it's losing. Um, it's losing in terms of the market is telling them that it will survive regardless of what they do. Overseas markets are saying we will gleefully bring this business in. Um, you know, one of the conversations I've had recently, which 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 struck someone, I, I think is fairly compelling at that level, was if you could go back in time, 50, 75 years, if you had a time machine, go back in time and say, okay, and you can grab whoever whoever's in charge at that point and say, hey, you know, I know you guys don't think that computers are going to be a big deal, but just in case you're wrong, maybe it's not a great idea to have all semiconductor fabrication occur on a small island in arm's length from China. Like just maybe we want to rethink this just in case this computer thing is not a fad. Virtually 100% of people say, yeah, that would probably have been a good idea. Um, and so when you frame it that way, when I, meet, when I meet somebody who's bizarrely antagonistic to math, and that's really what it is. If you, if you hate block, if you, look, if you don't think Bitcoin's a good asset to buy or sell, to own, we can have an, an intelligent discussion about that. Not everyone believes in every asset. Um, if you think that it's a Ponzi scheme or you think that it um, you know, has a higher probability of fraud, you're, you're, either, you're either misinformed or you're using, you're using weaponized misinformation, which some people absolutely are. They're, they're smarter than that. They're aware of what's going on. They choose to weaponize misinformation. Uh, Bitcoin, you know, crypto as a tool for money laundering for terrorism, the classic example of weaponized misinformation. We know demonstrably it's not true. So if you're faced with that, you know, that, that type of misinformation, um, I think you either have to, you know, again, if it's the first type of misinformation where someone's just genuinely unaware, uh, you educate them. Um, if you're faced with weaponized misinformation, you have to just fight back through either uh, litigation or, or uh, through the political, political means or through uh, public appeals. And I think the industry is doing that very well. And so I think the industry is winning overall. Um, I'm disappointed in the reaction. I think if you know, regulators, when seeing that the markets are demanding something and seeing that they're working, I think they should, in the face of that information, reevaluate their position. That doesn't seem to be happening here. So that's disappointing. But I'm very, very confident that the smart, good people at these regulators um, uh, will continue to do their work. Uh, and then over time, we'll see the U.S. gain, uh, gain back prominence in, uh, in, this, in this sector. So Bitcoin has been in this range. It's sort yeah. of 60-ish, 70-ish, 58, 70-ish, 58, 72. Uh, yeah. What do you think happens? I love working for an exchange because I get to just punt on all this stuff because, again, I, don't, I, I care about market structure and integrity. I'll, I'll make one comment. Um, I have never, in my, you know, my background's commodities. I have never seen, whether you believe Bitcoin's a commodity or, or something different, I, I think of it as a commodity. Um, I have never seen an ETF, a single asset ETF, where the underlying referenced asset, or in commodity in this case, um, over time, with the, with the growth of that ETF, uh, where the underlying asset has not uh, exhibited two characteristics, increased price and decreased volatility. So um, I don't know when, but I know that the pressure of that ETF expansion, and again, remember, we, we, it, was, it was definitely top two, arguably top one ETF launches of all time. And it's still not a sold, um, uh, it's still not able to be sold at any of the broker dealer money center banks, right? So it did all of that with, a, with hand, handcuffed behind its back, it did all of that. Eventually, when brokers are allowed to actively sell it, you'll see increased pressure, buy pressure, buy side pressure. And I think you'll see improved market dynamics, uh, increase in price, and decrease in volatility. I'm going to push this narrative on you and just test you yeah. with it. Okay, uh, uh, Peter Thiel, an early investor in Bitcoin, made a fortune off of Bitcoin said at the Aspen Ideas Festival last week that he thinks it's done. It's fully valued. The ETF story is played out. The halving story is played out. There's no more incremental investors. And Bitcoin is sort of done. Not that it's going to go down, but it's sort of going to plateau in value here. How would you respond to that? I guess it's easy to say when you've when you've caught the initial wave. Um, and by the way, I wouldn't suggest people invest in Bitcoin because they think it's going to go up another 10,000%. I think that's silly. You know, I, 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 have, I haven't seen his full comments, but I'd counter that with, 
you've got really, really smart macro and um, uh, macro guys like Bob Elliott on Twitter talking about re-rating neutral inflation expectations from historical 2% to 45 percent What does that do for risk assets like Bitcoin? Um, you know, do, do you think we're moving into an era of increased stability on this planet, political or otherwise? No, I don't. I don't. Uh, we haven't I mean, even you know, you know, you know, you know, so unfortunately, no time soon. I don't I don't see right. an era of. You know, I mean, it's just right. terrible say, but it's just not anytime soon. You know, yeah. um, what, what, I, what I'd respond to is that, it, it, that that analysis sounds like the analysis we hear every four to five years about crude oil. Um, you want to if you want to laugh, Google uh, Forbes, I think it's Forbes or Fortune magazine covers about crude oil for the last 30 years. Every two or three years, they do a cover saying we're awash in crude oil. Crude oil is going to zero. And then three years later, there's the same art cover, except it's a desert. We have no more crude oil. It's going up forever. Right. So that's the they nature that, of these commodities. They do that a lot, unfortunately. Yeah. I'm just trying to understand that. I mean, they did that to us in the yeah. 80s. They told us that we were running yeah. out of oil. They said it was peak yeah. oil theory. We yeah. were running out of oil. And then, of course, yeah. we didn't run out of oil. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, so these scarce essential assets. And again, it depends on if you believe. I believe Bitcoin is a scarce essential asset. Um, I think if you live in a part of the world where the government could just break down your door, hang you up at a hotel, beat you until you give you their money, um, having an immutable, storable, fungible store of value is scarce and rare, uh, scarce and valuable. And if you believe that, then we'll go through these peaks and valleys, but the long-term pressure should be consistently up. Now, if his argument is we're not going to have another 10,000% appreciation, we can have a discussion about that. I, I don't know how I feel about that, but um, but but to argue it's done, uh, you know, that that's a bit of an entitled argument. I think that it's maybe done for you, but I don't think it's done for all the parts of the world that need it. Okay, um, I want to switch gears because Coinbase is a brokerage company that does asset management as well, but a brokerage company that has a lot of different coins on its platform. Yep. So if you were a Mar uh, Martian was landing from Mars and said, OK, Bitcoin, I get that uh, sort of digital gold could be even bigger than that. How how do you uh, assess these other coins? There's a ton of research on them and there's no, uh, I think, consensus on how to value. You can, you can look at your just traditional value metrics. You can look at sort of more tech oriented metrics. There's a ton of research available on Coinbase uh, research website. I teach about this and I think about this a lot. The, the clearest ex analogy I give when I speak to people who want to learn about this, um, I think of these blockchains and the associated tokens as business ideas. Very simple. So, so Ethereum is a business idea that you can build on our platform, decentralized businesses. Uh, Bitcoin is a business idea that the problem it's seeking to solve is store value and unit of currency. So on, so on and so forth. Um, Litecoin, a faster version of Bitcoin, lighter version of Bitcoin. So mm -hmm. I think about very simply, if, if, if these blockchains have, are successful businesses, um, you will pay, and, and let's, say, let's say we live in a world now where for a long time where fiat will continue to exist and, and, and dominate uh, currency transactions. So the business idea, the blockchain, has to be worthy of the friction associated with getting in and out of fiat to the native token. Mm -hmm. And if it's successful, you'll do it. And my argument as to why people will do it is, I ask this every, every class I teach. I ask people who uses Amazon. 100% of people lift their hand up. I say, great, keep your hand up. Uh, today, Amazon has announced that you can't use dollars anymore. You kept using Amazon token. And keep your hand up and lower your hand when I get to the exchange rate, at which point you will not use Amazon anymore. So let's say, um, let's say I say one cent. So one cent friction to get into Amazon. Everyone keeps their hand up. I keep going up, two cents, three cents, four cents. At around 10, 12 cents, a few hands start going down. Most hands are down at around 15 to 20 cents. So what does that tell you? That the friction, that Amazon is so good at what they do, that you'll pay 20% friction in order, to, um, in order to, to use them. So blockchains have to compete with that. And if they're able to, you'll, you'll pay the friction. No different from Disney, no different from Amazon. So I'm going to rephrase it back to you, and then we're going to take questions from our audience, okay? Sure. Uh, but basically what you're saying is that the blockchain is representing a rail system uh, and it's going to help us uh, 
with more frictionless, lower cost, in some cases, costless transactions among ourselves. Uh, said differently, it'll be a little bit like uh, uh, the way I can do this call with you, this speak up show costlessly over the internet. You know, or if I need to call Italy, it costs me $5 a minute uh, 40 years yep. ago, but today it costs me no dollars a minute. Yeah. And there may be some problems that the application of blockchain, at least for now, can't be, is not better at solving. And that's, right. and that's okay. Right. Um, you know, I don't, I don't try to convince anyone about this. I don't try to convince anyone to buy or sell an asset. Um, and by the way, Anthony, let me say this. I don't think everyone, um, I think everyone should experiment with blockchain. And I think Bitcoin, Bitcoin ownership is a great way to experiment, but not every asset's right for every person. So, you know, if somebody, if somebody understands it and says, I still don't want to buy the asset, whether that's derivatives, whether that's real estate, crude oil, gold, platinum, U.S. equities, munis, or Bitcoin, um, th there's, there's, there's fairness in that argument. Let's take some questions from the audience. I First know question, we're alive. Okay. Are, crypto, are crypto exchanges secure? How do I know my investments are safe? This is Rose from New Jersey. Yeah. Um, look, there's risk. There's risk everywhere. Um, there has, and I can just speak for a firm like Coinbase. Um, uh, there's two ways to store your assets in crypto exchanges. There's what's called a cold wallet. So think of that as a hyper secure way to store your assets if you're not going to use them. So think of it as your savings account. You don't need it in the short term. Um, and there's never been a hack of that. So if you have the money in your savings account uh, equivalent, there's never been a hack associated with that. Um, there have been hacks associated when you move it into the hot wallet to transact. Most of those occur for complex transactions. We're using what are called bridges to get in between different currencies. Um, but for exchanges like Coinbase, um, there has not been a just a standard theft of, of your assets. Um, I want to talk about this for one second because a lot of viewers, even ones who aren't um, uh, knowledgeable about crypto, they've heard of, say, FTX. And it was, it was a horrible situation and i think i think uh i think about nine billion uh roughly was lost and i think a lot of, a good portion of that was recovered i just want to put that into context in the same year that that happened the london metals exchange canceled 38 billion dollars of copper trades they just decided end of day if we settle all these trades so many firms will go bankrupt we just have to clear it all out now if you're on the other side of that trade at that time that is no different from having money robbed from you. It's absolutely the same. There's no, if, you, if you said, I made 100 bucks in this trade or I had 100 bucks in this account, you wake up the next day and the exchange calls and says, hey, sorry, somebody stole your $100. Or that trade where you made 100 bucks, we canceled it. It is economically identical. But I bet none of your viewers have heard about that. So $38 billion was stolen. And I think net net less than like a billion, even less maybe, less than a couple hundred million were missing from FTX after recovery. And yet we're still talking about FTX as this kind of incredibly embarrassing thing that happened to crypto and it's causing people doubt about crypto. And yet we're not having that same discussion about the broader commodities markets. So my point being, uh, there's risk everywhere, but if you're doing basic buy sell transaction of tokens like Bitcoin on regulated exchanges here in the US, um, I don't see any measurable difference between the risk of doing that and buyer selling commodities or stocks. Okay, sounds good to me. Let's go to the next question. Uh, how do hurricanes like barrel affect markets? This is in your wheelhouse as an old oil trader, especially yeah. with big investors living in the Cayman Islands or Puerto Rico. This is Paul from yeah. Florida. They can. I'll tell you a quick story. So back in the day um, when uh, the tragedy of Hurricane Katrina hit the city of Houston, um, it was evacuated. Houston was partially evacuated for the first time ever. And I was back in my NYMEX days. I was head of strategy for the, for the exchange there. And we had this very, very vibrant natural gas market. Natural gas, one of the most important commodities in the world. And it was a really vibrant market, traded like water, very liquid. And it just died. And we were all kind of scratching our heads, what the heck's going on? And we realized that this very vibrant, wide and deep market we thought we had was actually like 19 hedge funds in Houston. <laughs> that controlled like most of the liquidity. And I learned a really valuable lesson. Um, concentration, whether it's geographic, whether it's by type or by motivation of entering a market, um, can fool you into thinking markets are wide or deep. So now the good news is 
um, you know, Puerto Rico's suffered some massive, because uh, there, there are a lot of crypto people in Puerto Rico. And despite suffering from some horrible hurricanes, we haven't seen that uh, happen to, uh, to crypto. Nice thing about crypto is it trades 24 seven. Anyone in the world can trade it if they have a computer. Um, you don't require heavy infrastructure. And so, um, well, I'm not going to say there isn't a bit of a concentration issue in, in Bitcoin, because there is, no, it clearly is. Um, the ability of that market to diversify, uh, both geographically, economically, and, and otherwise, um, is, is far more, uh, it's, far, it's there far more than traditional markets. Um, so we, we haven't seen an impact um, outside of humanitarian. Uh, you know, set best wishes to anyone watching from the overseas territories right now, because I know Cayman and uh, other places are about to get walloped. Uh, so we wish them well, uh, but it doesn't really appear to impact crypto markets materially. Um, I think the, the, the lunar the lunar celebrations in China impact markets more uh, psychologically than uh, than hurricanes do. All right, let's go to the next one. Looking like nothing is changing in the Democratic support for crypto, no. which seems to be the case. So will this turn out to be a big issue during the election? Well, this is Joe from Brooklyn. So, look, we have we have heard that the Democrats are making overtures into crypto uh, over the last couple of. I'm not sure if I agree with that. I, I think maybe if I add, add one word, it looks like not enough is changing in Democratic support for crypto. Uh, I think that's a fair statement. But I think I think it is fair to say that since um, since Trump came out uh, decidedly pro crypto, and since the the realization of 52 million, I, I want to make sure people understand this. So, roughly 52 million Americans have bought crypto. Roughly 52 million Americans have bought stock. I want, to, I want to say that again. Now, I'm not talking about stock ownership through pensions and other ways. That's much, much higher. But about the same number of Americans have made a conscious decision to go on to an online broker and buy a share of stock that have bought crypto. It's a very, very important voting contingent. That's now become known. I'm not, we, we, we've been screaming this for years, but suddenly in the last, say, say two months, suddenly for some bizarre reason, you know, God bless the good, the good folks at uh, Coinbase Policy who are helping with this. Uh, the Stand with Crypto PAC has done a great job. But now everyone's suddenly aware that there's a lot of young people who vote, who care about this enough to make it a single issue. Um, and so the Democrats have made overtures. I, I think the, 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 the consensus belief is that the ETF being pushed through is, is part of those overtures. Um, is it enough? I don't think so. Um, because we're still seeing regulation by enforcement. We're still seeing, you know, a bizarre reticence to be open-minded about this technology. Again, I go back to, I go back to my original point. Do we want 50 years from now, do we want future Americans to sit there and say, why the heck did we allow all this stuff to be built offshore? Like we're saying now with Taiwan, it's not just an economic issue for Taiwan. It's a military issue. Most of my smart geopolitical friends think we will have a kinetic war with China over Taiwan solely due to semiconductor fabrication. Do we want to make that same the same mistake for crypto and for AI in, in 25 or 50 years? Um, so, so there's been a shift, but it, unfortunately, it hasn't been a significant enough shift. And yes, I think it will play into the results. I love it. Not going to say anything. Let's go to the next one. Ah. So um, only Who's because... That man. Only because when I was a little bit younger, I, I got confused for him at the airport. I got to go with Christian Bale. I got pushed through security because they thought I was Christian Bale. So I got to go with him. I think you better look at him, Christian Bale. Oh, you, oh, you're so, no, you're so mean, sweet. You're Italian. Christian Bale's not Italian. He's like, I was like about, about five years ago. I was jacked. I got uh, He's great. He's great. And I got to go. I mean, Michael Keaton for nostalgic. For nostalgia's sake, I mean, I'll just always remember my. I just remember Michael Keaton being the funniest because there was no way he could beat up anybody. But um, and he's he's the best actor without question. But I gotta say, I gotta go with Christian Bale and Henry Cavill for uh, Batman and Superman. So didn't Michael Keaton play Batman again in a recent movie, The Flash? No, Beetlejuice. Didn't he's he's he's, he's back. Oh, he's coming back for Beetlejuice, but he was in The Flash. He played Batman in the movie. I did not see that. I got yeah, I gotta yeah. watch it. He's, good Amer stuff. He's an American treasure. All right. Well, you are an American treasure. Uh, you are somebody that I admire and respect in our industry. I appreciate Likewise. you coming on. I wish you an amazing holiday. Uh, thank you for Same joining Anthony. us uh, on a holiday week for Speak Up. Um, uh, but I'm going to pull you for one last question, though. Okay. Yeah, sure. Actionable investment that 
our viewers can make right now, something you see in the mortgage that you totally love? By Bitcoin or by the Bitcoin ETF, if you're if you don't want to hold Bitcoin directly. All right, Caesar, you answer it the same way I do. All day. Yep, small, day. small amount. Small amount. Um, treat it as a, a risk asset. Learn about it. Take time. Talk to your kids. Talk to your nieces. Talk to your nephews. Talk to your younger younger friends. Um, it is a, it is a bit of a generational divide um, in terms of acceptance and uh, comfort. But I'll I'll, I'll just I'll, I'll leave you with this. Um, not that long ago, the rules of the internet were don't give anyone your phone number or your credit card, and don't mm -hmm. get into a car with strangers. <laughs> Now we, now we send our information across and we gleefully jump into a stranger's car. Um, things change and they'll change in your lifetime. So be prepared. Right. Amen. Well said, my friend. Thank you for joining us. If you like this video, you'll like this video as well. Check it out.